Welcome back to the Scaffolding Magazine podcast. Today I have a fascinating guest. Matthew Wright traditionally published 55 books that amounted to over 2 million words in print by the most famous publishing houses in the world. To learn more about Matthew and to find out secrets of his success in publishing, keep watching. Okay, well, there you are. There we go. <laughs> okay. Well, Matthew, how are you? Yeah, well, look, talking about writing, uh, what can I tell you? Uh, I have great questions for you, and some of them really should be a pain, but in a fun way. Let me introduce you first uh, to the audience. Matthew, this is so exciting. I have a chance to interview you. Um, and uh, thanks to the first issue of the Scaffolding magazine, where uh, you contributed a, a piece of writing about which we will talk a, a little bit later, but for the sake of our readers, let me just tell them a few words about you. Um, I've known you via social media uh, for how long has it been? Like um, since year? last year, it must be eight, eight or ten months since, since you really like started that? setting the scaffolding up. This sounds about right. What I've learned about you, you have two million words in print. That is enormous. That is just, oh my God, 55 books in traditional, uh, through traditional publishing uh, companies. 55 books. Okay, let's just uh, let it sink in for a second. Um, this is a lifetime of writing and publishing experience and i'm really looking forward to get some of your perspectives on this ever-changing and shifting world of writing and where the new writers should be looking for success and inspiration and so i suppose let's, let's start from this uh, tell us about your writing career it's really entwined with typewriter um i i started writing with a pencil of course i was seven there was a contest that uh puffin books were running in new zealand the managing editor of puffin was coming out uh from england and they ran a contest a short story contest for kids i entered it and won it and uh and i won 50 puffin books of my choice some of which i still had and i i decided I liked writing and it got me going and uh, my mother had a typewriter it was an imperial uh, portable that she had hauled it up because I was fairly slow with handwriting and I started learning how to type I taught myself how to type so it was like with two fingers um, and basically I still type with two fingers um, well I, I use a few more than that but I don't type the way that you're meant to type I just do it <laughs> And uh, so, and that really got me going because you could you could write so much faster with a typewriter than you could with handwriting, and the words were, were very easy to to generate, and the words kept coming. So I, I kept writing, and and really it hasn't stopped. And uh, I, I was first published at age fourteen. Um, I, I was being formally taught how to write fiction. I did a lot of uh, courses at Polytech and so on as a teenager on writing and, and how to write and what writing was about and wore out one typewriter in the process, uh, got given another one, which I, I wish I still had because it looked very cool. Um, how, do, how do you, excuse me, uh, how do you wear out a typewriter? This is an oxymoron. But... You type a lot on them. Okay. Uh, you, you type until the, the, all the mechanical parts have got wear on them and then, then you throw it away and get another one. And, uh, and I actually did that twice. Yeah. The, the third typewriter, which I still have, didn't wear out. Um, it was a much more robust machine. Uh, and, and then, of course, computers came along and, you know, you, you sort of have to go with the flow there. So um, now I wear out keyboards instead. So... <laughs> But yeah, it's been a lot of writing, and and I I write every day. I've always got something happening, something that I'm trying to write or thinking about what I need to write, or an idea comes in. And of course, you know, writing books through the traditional system, you get contracts with deadlines. 
which have to be met. It's a professional um, requirement, professional job. The 55th book is being published this Friday, actually. Oh, congratulations. That's so exciting. What is it about? Well, it's, um, you, you might have seen it on my blog, actually. It's a military history. It's a New Zealand military history of the social experience of what it was like to be a soldier in uh, our two First World War campaign, uh, Gallipoli and on the Western Front. Um, and I, I went through a whole lot, pile of diaries, I had a look at the records and so on, and found out quite a lot of horrifying stuff. Um, and that's being published on Friday. And I've got fiction being published. I mean, there's scaffolding, of course. You've got a story coming up in the next issue. Yeah, we're going to um, talk about that in detail. I looked through your list of the books, Blue Water Kiwis, and I'm pretty sure these are not about the green fuzzy fruit. Tell us about what this book is about. Oh yes, well I have to tell you about the fruit first because okay. um, it's, 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 it's actually a Chinese gooseberry, we used to call it when I, when I was a kid. And uh, New Zealand um, horticulturalists bred it for size, had to give it a new name, so they named it after the national bird which is a flightless bird, nocturnal flightless bird with a long beak that looks really awkward. Um, and it's our national icon, national symbol, and we call ourselves Kiwis. And, and of course, because we export kiwi fruit, everybody thinks kiwi is a type of fruit, but, but actually it's the bird and it's the New Zealanders, well, for us anyway. And the book was about New Zealand's naval adventures of the first second world wars blue water kiwis because we were doing it a long way away from home uh, right round in the north sea um, i actually wrote it i was uh, it was drawn in for the royal new zealand navy's um, 60th anniversary we had a launch party on the flight deck of one of our frigates uh, which was very cool and and got to have drinks in the wardroom afterwards which was very cool and uh, i ended up uh, we, we returned, my uh, wife and I uh, returned to our motel uh, where I ended up having to climb in through the kitchen window of it and ended up head first in a sink. So, you know, book launches appear to be very glamorous, but they can end up quite awkwardly. So that was Blue Water Kiwis. New Zealanders turn up everywhere. The, the, the Blue Water Kiwis story, we were all over the world in the, in the Second World War. We um, were on the convoys that took supplies through to um, Soviet Union, and, and we had uh, ships up around Japan by the end of the Second World War, and we had Indian Ocean, we had ships in the Mediterranean, all, right all over the place. Not very many ships, but we, we went everywhere. And this tiny little island at the bottom of the South Pacific, doing all that. Mm. Uh, and I thought it was quite cool. That, that's fascinating. I've, you know, I feel like Steven Spielberg perhaps should be listening because <laughs> we get a military history from all over the world and I have not seen too many featured films about New Zealand. What is your favorite history book that you've written? Ooh. <laughs> well, it, it varies you see it's whatever the last one i wrote is um i wrote a book called guns and utu now uh utu is a maori word it means uh reciprocal payment uh revenge um getting equality it's, it's got a whole it doesn't have a meaning in english that's direct and the book was about the wars that were fought here in New Zealand in the 1820s when the British first arrived and uh, Maori obtained British industrial equipment including guns and it was a complete uh, upheaval and uh, there, there have been books written on it but I thought well I'll write one as well so I was I was quite pleased with that one there was a book I wrote on New Zealand colonial society, comparing it with American society of the same day, which that was very, very similar. In fact, a lot of Americans were actually here at the time. 
uh, and, and a reviewer compared it to Tolstoy. So I was very, very pleased about wow. that. I couldn't see how they could do it, but they did. So I was quite happy with that. Um, <laughs> so that, that was, um, it was called Old South. So that, that was quite, quite a highlight. So, I mean, who knows what I'm going to write next? There might be a book that turns up that becomes my new favorite. I don't know. <laughs> sure. Um, And don't forget to subscribe. Seriously, subscribe. Thank you. <laughs> well, the book that I read of yours is one of your later um, books, Explaining Our Weird Universe. Oh, yes, yes. That's, um, I called it Volume 1 because I was yeah. kind of hoping there might be a Volume 2. I, I haven't got that far yet. It really, Volume 1 has to sell first, more than it has. Yeah, well, I started off doing all the sciences, so I, I was particularly keen on physics, and uh, I was brought up with it. My father was a, a, an electronics engineer, and so I was brought up with all that. And so I thought, well, yeah, I can write something about, you know, I've always had an interest in uh, physics and cosmology and black holes and quantum stuff. And I thought, well, I could probably write something on that. So I did, and and that was the book. It's it's had a bit of coverage, actually. I was interviewed the other week on it um, for a, an English uh, blogger, in fact, interviewed me, and that was published a week or two ago. So um, it, it's, again, I, I, I find these things cool. And it's just fascinating to just check out all sorts of things about the universe and history and people and, things you know um, there's just endless fascination in the whole world so i would like to uh, talk a little bit about this uh, little book it's 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 not a very lo uh, long book um, oh it's it was only fifteen thousand words which is very short and yeah. I, i'm going to there will be a print edition if it continues to sell went out as an ebook first i don't think it'd be more than about 60 pages maybe less so there was my question, which you kind of just explained. What sets you apart from books of the kind, like let's say by Stephen Hawking? And you kind of just explained it. It's like really short. It's very easy to uh, get through it. And it's uh, written very accessibly for somebody who is not a scientist, but would like to uh, know something about what science is all about these days. And so, can you tell us more a little bit about this book? Yeah, um, well, I mean, the, the thing about current science is there's just so much that we are discovering that, that starts to get answers. There, there's been a, a great conundrum in the last century was that Albert Einstein found out how the universe we see around us worked. And uh, he exactly described it. I mean, you, you cell phone, today would not work, the GPS part of it would not work if we didn't take Einstein's theory into account. And, and the mathematics of the uh, GPS satellites have to correct for Einstein's relativity. So we know it works, but it didn't work with the unseen universe, with the quantum universe. And, and so the, the, the issue has been, how do you make the two work together? Nobody's found an answer and they still haven't. And so that, to me, says, well, there's there's some pretty fascinating stuff there. How can we understand Einstein? How can we understand the quantum stuff? You know, as as, as the first step to 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 bring some of these ideas out to as many people as possible. And and so I wrote a book that was basically describing Einstein as simply as I could manage for people that hadn't you know that didn't do science, but which was pretty cool to, to know. And then I thought, well, I'll do quantum physics. And, and what I found there was that there's a lot of uh, misconception about it. There's a lot of thinking that it, it's almost like magic. And mm. uh, actually it isn't. And, and so I thought, well, I'd better describe what it's really like, uh, which is awkward because I'm not sure I understand it and I'm not sure anybody else does either. Exactly. Um, <laughs> So that's what I was trying to do. And then I thought, well, you know, there's a plenty of other stuff out there that I can also do in volume two, uh, which, which I'm hoping will come along. So.
And don't forget to subscribe. Seriously, subscribe. Thank you. Did you find out the biggest scientific question these days? Was the cat dead or alive? Meow. To find out an answer to this and many more questions, subscribe to this channel and wait for the part 2 of the interview.